Serge, so in the in the episode just previous, we've landed the bomb that intelligence is from either one of two sources. And if you haven't watched that episode yet, tune into it because it's spectacular. You've got the callousness of of a spiritual intelligence uh, that's ruthless, it's competitive, etc. You've got the souls based intelligence, which is love and equalness for all. So I want to look at a, a contemporary a contemporary issue and and that is quite quite seemingly random for this program but it's 2013 the NFL in America was exposed in a documentary called A League of Denial by by PBS reporters and basically what they found was that a, a doctor of Nigerian descent who lived in small town America came across in his autopsy room the body of one of the most famous, the, uh, from the Pittsburgh Steelers, I think it was, uh, one of the most famous NFL players in that region. Very much decorated, very, very um, applauded by the community. He had no idea about football. He, he had no idea who this person was. All he saw was a body. And he saw the body of a 70-year-old, but it was a 50-year-old who had died and he, the body was mangled, he, his teeth had fallen out, he glued them back in with super glue. He had been taser he, in, his, in his final days, he lived out of a car and he'd lost all mental cognition. So he was, he was very blurry in, 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 the way, in his speech and, and with his brain, but he couldn't settle in his body. So he, he actually started tasering himself and shocking himself to give himself the relief to be able to fall asleep for a few minutes at a time kind of thing. So uh, total state of disrepair of this, this man's life. What this doctor found was that in his brain was a kind of brain disease that was caused by uh, concussion over and over again, which is standard in NFL. The helmets bash into each other and the brain shakes and the brain gets bruised. This is just part and parcel of the game, right? So, to cut a long story short, basically he discovered this degenerative brain disease that was happening in football players. And he took it to a, a science, like a medic, like a sports science symposium and, and presented this incredi these incredible findings and said, you know, we've got to warn football players this is, this is happening. And thought that his discovery would be met with you know, applause, it was a huge discovery, which is a kind of intelligence that comes from care for the human being, right? And, and so on the other side, the, the NFL got wind of this and, and hired its own scientists to absolutely savage this guy. And this guy was called a voodoo doctor. Where did he get his um, doctor certificate from the back of a milk carton? These, these are the kind of things that undermine the reputation. He's, he's completely you know, they try to completely shut him down. And anyway, it does come out that the NFL have tried to cover this up. And in 2000, I think it might have been 2015 or maybe a bit earlier, uh, they, they settled out of court for all the victims of the NFL, uh, the, the players who they'd covered up this, this, this brain disease problem to. They settled out of court for over a billion dollars or something like that. And, and to date, they've I think they've paid out over $600 million to players and their families for this, for this cover-up. But then, this is the interesting part, and this will come as no surprise to you, I, I'm sure, but I want to read this, this from an article in, um, in 2015 or 2017. Yeah, it's a 2017 article titled, Brain Trauma is Scary, but the NFL is as popular as ever. The people have spoken and that they love the game they, and, they, and they don't care if people are getting harmed in it. So, so that's one part of it. But the end of the documentary where they exposed all this, the, the, the journalist said, if we believe that the violent, that violence that is inherent in football is setting off a sort of cascading neurological effect in your brain, 
that may leave you prematurely brain damaged, completely change you as a human being and even kill you, how many people are going to want to play it? Plenty. <laughs> this, is the, this is the absolute anomaly. And what the NFL was most afraid of was that, that mothers of Little League players would stop their boys from playing football. What do you think the rate was of mothers stopping their children playing football was? There was a 20% decrease in the amount of children that were, that were put into to Little League. So you've got 80% of parents thinking that it is okay to do a, a sport that they know will, will likely cause brain damage to their child, which led that original doctor to say, this game is tantamount to child abuse if you let your child play it. And that's the only logical you, conclusion you can come from the, from the intelligence of the soul. But yet, that's not what rules the world at the moment, is it? What is actually running the show here? that a parent would knowingly put their child into harm's way. He, he actually asked the question, please, do you love your child more than football? Can you love your child more than football? Like, and that, that's quite an obvious proposition when you look at the facts. Over well, you're to talking to someone who is a little bit more unpopular than that voodoo doctor. Perhaps <laughs> I'm more voodoo than the voodoo doctor. <laughs> Um, and that's, you know, that's how I'm cast. Uh, the, the reality is, uh, you say 80% of uh, parents ignored the, the very obvious results that cannot be argued. Irrefutable evidence, so-called. So mm. And then you've got a situation where 20% responded. But where did that 20% go? We don't know. And that's, that's also an important uh, analysis an examination of what did that 20% do? Did they adhere to that uh, obvious result and sought um, you know, a very loving way or did they just substitute it to a lesser degree or a lesser risk? We don't know that. But let's just postulate for a moment on that. Now, the point is this. The, the situation is 100% of people where are they aligned to? Where is the source of intelligence? And that's what we've got to look at. We, we can't have a judgment on any... Because we are vehicles of expression. We can't have judgment. If a footballer uh, decides to... I don't know much about NFL. I don't watch television. I don't, don't follow any of that. So um, if, if, a, if a footballer plays that sport, let's say, so be it. If a person follows that sport, so be it. But are they really persons? See, our world has this perception that we are an I, or that we have the option of making choices. But are we not just going to be part of an intelligence that is not telling us any different? If we are aligned to the pranic consciousness, we are not going to be informed of anything different other than that which it wants us to express because we are the vehicles of, its, of itself. We are the, ex the expressive units of its intelligence. And that's what's going to revolutionize being human. Because we've already got more psychologists, more counselors, more psychotherapists, more sports psychologists, greatest physios, trainers, osteopaths, doctors, surgeons, the whole thing has, has exploded. There has never been, and social services, there has never been more support than ever before on the history of the planet. And we are still reproducing. No, not only still reproducing, but making far worse the situations of our behaviours that are leading to conditions that make absolutely no sense to an intelligent species. Mm. So we have to we can talk all day and you can bring up examples and then somebody will come along and, and poo-poo you and put you in the voodoo um, category as well. You know, and there's all these arguments. But you cannot argue against the history. You can't argue against the evidence. And the evidence is very simple. We don't need a PhD for the evidence. We don't need money on the evidence. Life is evidence. And it's for free. Just look around. And that will tell us that how we are living makes no sense 
whatsoever. There is no common sense to the type of intelligence that we have endorsed as being our intelligence. Mm -hmm. And if we break it down to that, then we can understand what's going on. Because I'm sure those footballers have also been involved in domestic violence. But then there's also academics who are involved in, uh, in domestic violence. There's all sorts of categories that have been involved in all sorts of things, divorce, marals, mater, materal, materal, marital problems, etc. All of that, where is the intelligence? What is giving us a true composure? What is informing the being that becomes the human when it comes to being human? And that being is not material. That, that information, that intelligence is not located in the being. Or well, it's not located in the human being, it's located in a being, but it's informed into the being. And once we understand that intelligence is outside of us, for example, our mind is not in our body, it's all around us. We actually tap into a mind. We don't have a mind. No one has a mind. I don't have a mind, you don't have a mind. But we get off Would you on, say it's like a frequency? You're tapping into a frequency? You're, tip, you're tapping into a sphere of, uh, of intelligence, mm. let's call it, and you are its vehicle of expression. What we do have, and the only thing we have, the only factor that we have, is the, is the power to align. So we have the authority to align. It's called the use of will. Will is not an, a, a, a process of making decisions. It's what aligns you to one consciousness or the other. And it can happen very, very quickly. Once you are aligned, you are it. Everything about it. And it's only when you uh, realign to the other one, you are also it. You are also its. So it's not like one allows you to be intelligent and one does not. They're both intelligence, just different forms of intelligence. So one is everything the other one is, minus the level of love, care, stillness, harmony, joy and truth that comes from the one universality that we know and understand and call a three-letter word called God. Beautiful. I, I, just, I just want to give one example because it, it seems to me like the intelligence that is sourced from the, the pranic or spiritual sphere is becoming more and more obvious. Or maybe it's just more obvious when you look at it with eyes that are loving, if you look at it from a soulful based intelligence. But just to deeper illustrate the callousness of that spiritual intelligence, I just want to read in regards to that NFL situation was that just back to that article about it's more popular than ever. The fans were finding it more popular than ever. More players were actually retiring earlier to avoid brain damage. And, and this, this article writer writes, the NFL needs bodies. As awful, yet no less true, as that sounds in a context of the discussion of CTE, which is the brain injury that they get. So basically they're out and out saying they need bodies for the Coliseum, basically. Um, to keep the number of youth players from dipping further, the NFL will keep endorsing safety initiatives like heads up football and tweaking rules on things like helmet to helmet contact and kick returns. All of it has very little impact on the actual safety of the sport. Tackle football is inherently violent and the promised violence is why many people watch. But those types of changes around the edges do have PR benefit. <laughs> so this is like the callousness is completely on display and the cynicism uh, that's inherent in this writing is like we know that that they are basically going to destroy their lives and their brains doing this and we don't care and we know that the NFL will just do fluffy PR benefit things to try to make people feel better about watching the Coliseum sport. So, so that is that is the pranic consciousness in like that's that's the spirit that controls the human being, just having no regard for the body that it affects. Can we talk a bit about who is this player? Who where does it, you know who is this spiritual being that that sources that we source our intelligence from in this so-called human life? Yeah. Look, um, two things. One. 
is the, uh, it's, we call it the spirit and soul, just to make it simple and, and to bring a truth to the word soul, and, which is deserving of honor because it's been uh, corrupted. And also the word spirit, which is actually a casual word for the other form of intelligence. It the, the, the true and official um, terminology should be God and ungod. Mm -hmm. So the soul is the son of God or God, and then the ungod, which is the, you know, it's the fallen version of the soul uh, acting in its own capacity by its own collective, forming its, uh, an intelligence that then feeds its own vehicle. So it's, a, it's really all about circulation energy. I hope I, I explain that as simple as it is, because it's really not more complex than that. Secondly, I'm going to up the voodoo here. So the voodoo, whatever it is, put me on whatever NFL front page news or whatever. I'm not going to pick on anything. I'm not going to pick on NFL. There's nothing to pick on because it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't really matter whether it's um, world championship wrestling mm -hmm. or karate, full contact or whatever. So let's assume that the entire human race had no sport. So no NFL, no karate, no, none of that. Let's assume we didn't have conflict. No head banging, so no CTE. That's assuming we didn't do anything that would, we would consider by visual examination untoward. Let's assume we all get on, there's no war, never been a war, there's no domestic violence, there is no... Uh, all marriages, they marry, they stay together, no divorces. Let's just real go out there and imagine the, the most perfect picture that we could imagine perfection to be in terms of not, an, not a speck of waywardness or untowardness. If we used the consciousness of the ungod, of, this, of the pranic consciousness, we would still be sick we would still have depression. We would still have problems because it's a fuel your body cannot sustain. It's no different to putting diesel in a petrol car. The car is perfect. It's never been in a collision. It's driven respectfully, the right gears, nothing abrupt, handbrake is used, it's turned on correctly, seatbelt is worn, the whole thing. If you give it the wrong fuel, it will collapse. The engine was not made to have diesel if it's a petrol engine, vice versa. If it's, a, if it's a diesel car, you put petrol in it, it's going to either not start or not function or break down. It's exactly the same thing. If you put water where there should be oil, it's the same thing in a car. If we use the wrong fuel, we don't need the car to have an accident to say it stopped. If we use the wrong fuel, it will eventually break down. So it's not a matter of picking on any industry whatsoever. We will always have a problem if we base human life on a fuel that is, that is intent on denigrating anything other than its own expression. It is only interested in seeing its intelligence being expressed. That's the sole intent of the creation of this sphere of life or the sphere of intelligence. It just wants to see itself in manifestation. It wants to see the outcome of its expression out, outside of itself. It's almost like if I'm the intelligence, I want to express through you and then through you or because of you, I'll get this or I'll get that and I'll get this object and that object. And it's almost like the intelligence in its prior looking back and saying, wow, look at that, I created NFL, I created a car, I created an institute called university, I created this model called parenting, I created this model called whatever, whatever, marriage, let's say. But none of that which has been created is, crea is, the, is, is the end impulse of something that is holding what it's creating in a universal manner. And so that's where we strip it all the way back. And we don't have to have any examples, just the purity of how wrong the whole thing is at its very basis. Because the fuel that we use, the intelligence that we use, in other words, is completely wrong. It is not our truth.
so why? Like why does, you talked about the vehicle doesn't source its own intelligence. It is sourced from another being. And that, from my understanding of your work, is that that is the spirit or the un-God. There's a, there's a wayward being that is, that is impulsing this character that we think is the human being, that we think thinks, that we think makes choices, but in fact can't possibly make choices because it doesn't make sense that we'd make so many detrimental ones. So, so this source, this, this spiritual source that's sourcing the human being, what does it get out of this puppet show? What does it get out of the turmoil it puts the human being in? The, you know, the calamity of life or even the highs and the happy moments in life. What does it get out of the setup? What it's getting is its own expression in form. It's its own pride. It is it's very proud of its intelligence. Mm. It's proud of creation. It loves to create and it has a desire to continue to create. Mm. But let's, let's go, let's put the example this way. If we have a playing field and you're using sport as an example, so let's use it as an analogy. So we've got a player on the field who is so outstanding. You, no, no team that has that player loses because they just score and score and score or, or they're great at defense or whatever. So they either stop the team from scoring or they are the highest scorer. Mm -hmm. Everybody who is not in that team wants to stop that player. That player is number one enemy. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're in that team, you love that player. Let's assume in this particular team, um, very few support this team. And they have such a player. In fact, they've got quite a few players, but they have one just happens to be outstanding, a little bit more than the others, probably a little bit better trained, but not necessarily more talented, just a little bit more in the training from the coaches. And this particular player put, puts out there this incredible scoring capacity, but also defending capacity. And no one, no one can beat it. Therefore, it's the entire conglomerate of the, of, the glee, of the league put together that has to stop this, not only team, but this one player. Welcome to my life. <laughs> I am that player. Mm. And I'm the one that's exposing the fact that there is an intelligence that is destroying us. I'm, I'm telling the world that I'm scoring on the basis of making sure that we understand that there is love and truth and wisdom and those who play in that team are guaranteed of success because it works and that's what we need to understand so we have to also understand that I am the player that's stopping the intelligence from winning or they see me as the number one enemy because if I keep talking if I keep presenting if I keep writing my books and I have done so you have to defame me you have to tell that I, you have to say that I'm a liar, I'm a charlatan, but my life has proven, at least in the last 21 years, since 1999 and now we are in 2019, that it works. And it works not just for me, it works for everybody equally. There's no privileges. And so we, we get distracted by these examples of games and this, but the biggest game on the planet, the biggest game on the planet, should not be about competition. It should be about producing the intelligence that helps us all equally. And this type of intelligence has not helped us all equally, has not provided, the, we haven't yet to eradicate this proportion. I mean, there's this proportion in academia. Who's the smartest, who's, who's not as smartest? We now have degrees, masters, honors, PhDs. How many PhDs are we going to get? And where does it go after that? I've heard a very good prediction, which I won't say here today. <laughs> but I agree with that prediction because what's next? Where is it going to stop? How many professorships? Well, let, let's say the prediction. The prediction is that we will invent something that is higher than PhDs. Because if every man, woman and his dog, excuse the jargon, will get, have to have a PhD by the time they're 12 or 15 perhaps, 
um, because probably their ages will be now lower. You have to probably get a PhD in high school before you go to university. You need a PhD to get into university. <laughs> why not? It's so, what we can't. Well, why not? I mean, it's going to get like that. Mm. And I'm not, it's not a mockery of, of the system. It's a mockery of a system that hasn't stopped to examine itself and identify if it is in fact failing. And it's a system that is steeped in self-reward. And I'm talking about everything on the planet now, not just mm. universities and academia. It is an intelligence that is steeped on reward and it hasn't stopped to examine itself. Because if it did, it has to, it put, it has to put its hands and feet up and vote with everything it's got that it has failed. Mm. There cannot be this proportion, surely, we're smart enough to not have this proportion. Surely we can have a society that can be so communal that no one needs to suicide. Mm. Surely we can raise men to hold on to their tenderness such that any form of violence, let alone domestic violence, is completely out of the picture. It's unimaginable. Surely we can raise women to sustain their own beauty such that there is no comparison no denigration, and so no lack of self-worth, etc., etc. There are so many things that have been around for thousands of years, and we have yet to get together collectively to put a stop to what is so easy to put a stop to, because we have had many, many teachers, many great examples that have not been part of that collective, of that intelligence. And so there has been a lot of let's say, those players that ruin the game. And what have we done to them? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question because if we, you talked about the Rosetta effect very briefly in, the, I think it was in the last episode, but, but let's just flesh that out a bit. And, and that was a community of, of people in America that were of Italian migrant descent and their, basically their um, well-being was a lot higher than every town around in, in this area. And scientists couldn't understand why, because there was no factor, not in their diet, not in their, their way of eating, not in the water, that would be attributable to this greater well-being in, 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 um, in terms of low heart attack rates and, and so forth the one factor that they found to be the difference was love. It was in that communal nature, it was in the community and, and, and the strength of the community and the, the elders supporting the younger people and the, the, yeah, the generational support uh, and, and actual love that was in the community had an absolute amazing benefit on health and well-being. Now, when we look at the, the case of the way of the livingness and the students of the way of the livingness. We've had studies done on the students of the way of the livingness where they've just given, uh, in the form of a survey, where they've just given their honest answers about what their life is like. Their, the rates of obesity are lower than the general population. The rates of smoking are lower than the general population. The, the rates of alcohol abuse are non-existent in, in this community. Wouldn't that, from a loving intelligence, give anyone in the world pause to say what is going on here in an open and inquisitive manner? Instead, it was, as we know, absolutely savaged by other members of academia, absolutely savaged by members of the general populace, the media, just it completely attacked. And one of the questions that came up was, well, of course they're healthier they don't drink and smoke. But, but why is that many people choosing not to, to drink and smoke when so many people have trouble making that choice that is not to the detriment of the body? And it comes back to alignment, but it also comes back to an alignment to soul, which is a more loving intelligence for the vehicle you live in. But it also comes back to you because it also comes back to the science of reflection and what it means if somebody says yes to a reflection that is a model that is more loving 
and that, that actually this is a microcosm of what could be an absolutely glorious expansion of the human being into a more loving way of life, isn't it? Yes, but there's one problem, pride. Because if, 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 we, are, if we are discovered as having something that is accessible to everybody, very simply so, and it's come, to a, uh, it's come from, so-called so from, I never say it comes from me, but I'll say it's from, a person who's uneducated, then it's a big stumbling block to, to the model. It's a mm. big impairment. It's a big thwarting of what we've been told, you know, intelligence is supposed to be and the answers to humanity. I don't claim to be the source of what I do. I, I've always claimed to be a representation of what I'm aligned to. I've never said I've been, I'm the one or I'm special or, or anything like that. And I've, also a representation of what everyone can be. Exact, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's and equally accessible to everyone. From day one, when I, when I realigned and, and became my, uh, the representation of my soul, in that process itself, there is no I anymore. It's impossible to represent yourself as greater than anyone else because you know and are very are aware of the factor that what has altered or, or modified what was there before is an alignment and not the process of many years of work. And it happened very instantly, very, very fast. And so I can't have tickets on myself and say, well, you know, I did this and I did that and I searched and I read books and I discovered and I meditated and I went into the wilderness and came back and discovered this and that. I didn't. It was instant. And then it was a process of getting used to not being an individual, not being the owner of or thinking that you think or that, that you own thinking or that you own your intelligence. And that took a little bit of getting used to because there were remnants of, of that still around, but it didn't take long. And then you just say, well, if I can do it, anyone can. And it's a beautiful settlement that comes over the body when you achieve a, a, a form of composure that holds everybody in the same light, whether that person is choosing to be in that light or not. Well, it's an enormous, enormous love because you know that by reflecting that in an environment that is often rejecting of that, there's a, there's a great deal that's going to come at you in that, in that um, movement, but in that expression. But tell us about what it feels like when you're representing the all. You wouldn't take the, the attack personally, would you? Like, I don't. And, you know, if I'm that player that we used as an example before that becomes everybody's enemy if you're not in that team, uh, well, there's 600 of us now. There's 600, maybe even more. And I say 600 conservatively because I'm, um, I'm naming those who are a little bit more committed and dedicated and, re and truly representing at least a great pro proportion or a great, um, you know, great ratio of their soul. There could be even up to a thousand who are at least trying and that, and that can escalate. I mean, unless we're one day annihilated, mm -hmm. who knows what will happen. Uh, the point is that that should be celebrated. The point is, if intelligence was truly intelligent, you should not be challenged by something that is clearly showing that in its simplicity, there's a level of equanimity that what you represent cannot match. And it's not about one intelligence pitting itself against the other. It's simply a reflection, which is the word you used before, and I'm happy to be the reflection of that, and so are many other people, who are reflecting a way of being that is not competing, it's not vying to say it's the best, it is simply presenting a possibility. That possibility just happens to be the greatest form of consistency, the greatest form of living in a way that, that minimizes, without perfection, untowardness. And you can feel when you leave it, because when imperfect, then when you leave it, you will, you will stray, big deal. That doesn't mean you know, anything. But when you come back to it, it's always there. And the greatest thing is that when you come back to it, it doesn't judge where you've been. Mm. It simply slips you back in and says, let's keep going. It's a very, very beautiful form of intelligence. And everybody deserves to have it, because in truth, we are from it. It's our origins. And eventually, when we stop playing the game, we will come back to it.